Welcome everyone to another episode of Great Leadership. My guest today, a repeat guest from a few years ago, I think, and it is Joe Fuller. He's a professor of management practice at the Harvard Business School, co-leader of the school's initiative on managing the future of work, and former co-founder and CEO of the Monitor Group, which those of you in the management consulting space who have been following along for many years will recognize that name. Joe, thank you for joining me. My a pleasure, Jacob. Delighted to be back with you and your audience. Yeah, well, I've, I can't even remember what we talked about last time, uh, but today we have a lot of fun <laughs> stuff to go over, and uh, I wanted to start off with skill-based hiring and training. Uh, this is obviously yep. a huge topic of conversation in the HR world, in the business world, I mean, even in the leadership world in general. Um, so why don't we start with just high level. When people say skill-based hiring, what does that actually mean? It's primarily a way to replace hiring that's been done traditionally on the basis of uh, confirmable credentials, specifically college degrees. That starting about 2010, there was a major and continuing encroachment of college degree requirements in jobs that had not traditionally required them. And eventually it became an issue really catalyzed by concerns about uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, that since college degree holding is is skewed toward Caucasians and Asian Americans, and that far fewer African Americans and Hispanic Americans have college degrees, that degree requirements were becoming a barrier to more equitable hiring. Mm. And the thought was, if I just strip out those degrees, uh, what my friends at Opportunity at Work, Bayard and Goose have called the paper ceiling, you would unlock a candidate pool that would be equally qualified and simultaneously more diverse, so it would be a, a win-win. Interesting. And, and so what happened with that? Uh, so that's I've been talking about for a while. Where have we landed in that space? We've landed uh, in uh, a good first or second spot, but we're not making a lot of substantive progress. So what do I mean by that? It became uh, de rigueur for large companies to revisit and strip out their degree requirements. And there's the, the number of jobs no longer covered by degrees, degree requirements uh, that uh, had once been uh, covered by degree requirements has increased by four times in the last five to eight years. So a lot of jobs are no longer subject to those requirements. That's an unalloyed good. And I don't attribute to any company that, that took that that legitimate and and well-meaning first step anything other than they're trying to get on a path that arced more toward whatever care words you care to use righteousness or justice or fairness or whatever um the problem is like a lot of policy changes how do you make it show up in practice mm -hmm. so in Hiring managers, the people actually making the job decisions, they're used to hiring using college degrees as a way to distinguish between the upside and the aptitudes of applicants. Many of them for these jobs have only hired college degree holders historically. No one's got them to say, well, okay, you used to look for people with computer science degrees from a selective university or uh, business degrees from a four-year college or whatever, but now you, you're you going to look for skills. Gee, you need to think about what skills you're looking for and what evidence of those skills beyond a degree would be compelling to you. No one has, that I'm aware of, has set up Let's have a training program or maybe something as mundane as videos available in the corporate learning system about what's the difference between these two things and how do I do this new approach as opposed to the old approach. So what we found at Harvard in uh, conjunction with my partners at Burning Glass Institute 
uh, Matt Sigelman and I wrote a paper looking at how those how that elimination of the requirements had actually played out. And we found that something on the order of three and a half percent of the jobs that had been relieved of these constraints seemed to have then gone to non-degree holders. About a hundred thousand jobs altogether over a five year period. Okay. Yes. So we can look at that and say, gee, that's pathetic. You know, three and a half percent is nothing. Uh, it is difference. If you got an 89 in the test and a 92 and a half, that's a big difference. But but we don't know if that's a good number or not. It's still early, early innings. It's disappointing as a nameplate number. But when you look at the lack of investment in enabling hiring managers to make a different type of choices, yeah. you could also say, well, you know, it's uh, and also, by the way, j- just because you remove a degree requirement doesn't mean, in fact, that the job really skews likely to still given to someone with a degree. IBM removed lots of degree requirements, so about 75% of the positions formally covered had been liberated of those requirements. But then they added back after a few years about 15%. And I think the reason for that, uh, IBM has been a leader in this space, is that they said, look, you know what? Even though we can take the degree requirement away, the truth of the matter is we're never going to, it's it's so unlikely we're going to hire a non-degree holder that let's take it out of the accessible pool just so people don't waste their time applying for a job we're pretty certain they're never going to get. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so what do you think about the the skill-based hiring? Good idea, bad idea? Because not only are we talking about skill-based hiring, but a lot of organizations are creating now their internal talent marketplaces where they're also trying Mm -hmm. to maneuver employees inside the organization based on skills. So if you're in marketing and you want to transition to something like HR or customer service, what are the skills that you have that can be applied in those areas and maybe just upskill you in the ones that you're missing? Uh, And then there's a lot of talk on, is AI a good tool to be using for this. So is all of this a, a good idea? And maybe we can start with the the recruiting process before we go into the, the internal talent piece. I think it's a, a good idea for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is it, it does, the degree requirement in a lot of instances is gratuitous. And it's, it's been em, employed to in the service of making the recruiting process hyper efficient. So I don't know what your data suggests, Jacobs, but our, our suggestion, if you've got a decent paying job, a good paying job, let's say $75,000 a year, and a, you know, a company people have heard of, they're going to get four or 500 online applicants. Yeah. But the typical company interviews about 1% of those applicants. And to get from 400 to four, you have to use some blunt instruments because you're not going to hit print 400 times or 200 times or even 100 times. So if you can just take out swaths of people with something that's to you commonsensical, what that does though is create the very shortage of applicants that a lot of companies complain about because by putting in that zero one, you're in, you're out variable, you might be excluding somebody who has some college, no degree, 10 years of experience in your job for a premier company, and you never looked at them because you're you're wielding this meat axe just to make it easier for the recruiters who are generally in companies evaluated on how much money they spend recruiting an individual and how quickly they fill the job. You'll mm. notice there's nothing about quality of the ultimate hire, whether they're retained, whether they get promoted, whether they actually are productive quickly in the job, all that's moot. So I think it, it, but I think the systems effect is more important. If you're going to hire on a skills basis, you actually think about what am I looking for? That makes you look at your job descriptions and say, you know, there are paragraphs in here that I don't really care about. Yeah, you know, and I'm not actually hiring on these bases. 
I'm forcing the operators to say, what do you really need to be able to do to do this job? And that also gives me much more visibility into what you were getting at. Do I have skills matches or mismatches in my company? Do I have a talent pipeline that's going to give me the skills I'm looking for more and more across the company? And so I, I think this is a way to unstick some of the inflexible, you know, archaic way that we think about human assets and try to get it to a new level. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean everyone's going to get to that new level, but it might provoke it. Yeah. Um, and what about for the internal talent marketplace piece? Uh, so, for example, employees who are moving from one area to another. And here, a lot of companies are using AI. All right. There are a lot of vendors out there that are kind of coming into play. What are your thoughts on that whole approach? I think that's got a lot of promise. And if you look at the the data, uh, for example, we've had um, on our podcast, the CEO of Gloat and the CHRO of MasterCard on together. Okay. Uh, and the results are really pretty dramatic. I mean, you, mm. you, you see, first of all, the people are able to articulate they've got skills that maybe the company is not exploiting or didn't realize they had. It's very correlated with increased retention because people feel like they're developing a network in the company and maybe they can move more quickly out mm-hmm. of a job that they're getting bored with. Uh, and um, I think it enables a company to get to a place which is pretty attractive, which is matching <clears throat> skills availability with projects on the basis of the project's importance and pertinence yeah, to the company, not just to the supervisor. Mm. But there's also a lot of, um, I think, people who are skeptical too. Like there are several CHROs that I'm talking to that are, I don't know, they're, they're not sure about relying on AI tools for stuff like this, a lot of them see that there, there are challenges, right? Because, for example, there are a lot of intangibles that AI tools aren't able to measure. There's a lot of training that happens uh, in an employee's own time that AI tools can't measure. And there are a couple of CHROs that I've actually interviewed where they said they used AI tools as a kind of predictor for success for an employee and the AI tool predicted wrong. It said so-and-so is going to be successful in this role because they have the skills they put someone in that role, that person ends up not succeeding. So um, I guess it kind of comes down to who's a better judge of the skills that an employee has. Would it be a piece of AI or is it going to be the leader who actually is leading those employees directly? I think it's a hybrid. Hybrid of both. I think what you're going to see in HR, uh, what you're going to see in HR is what you're seeing in the the super advanced systems for supply chain management, uh, which I describe as decision intelligence, where the AI of generating recommendations, which are being evaluated and responded to by the human. Hmm. And in those systems, you see after a few thousand observations, the error rate plummets to zero. So the, 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 it's early innings to be judging the effectiveness of any of these technologies. And I'm sure early MRIs were, you know, radiologists would tell you, well, that wasn't exactly right. But certainly for generative AI, we're, we barely know how to use it for a lot of this stuff. So, so I'm com- very sympathetic with those CHROs. I get it. But um, there's, there's if, if you've got, Generative AI is going to be able, let's just take, I want to evaluate Jacob, okay? And I know his role. Pretty soon, generative AI will be able to look at everybody, the personnel file who ever, ever had, of everybody who ever had Jacob's job. Okay. While it's looking at the profiles uh, on things like LinkedIn, of the people who have that jobs and competitors. And it's going to be able to look at the application of everybody who's applied for that job in the last five years and do all that in a nanosecond and then give you a summary of considerations, which you then can inquire about through prompts in, it'll take much longer for the display to fill 
that it will for do the analysis. Hmm. So the ability to harness textual data that has where we basically relied on the heuristics of mental models of supervisors or or talent management people and you know we're very smart about these things about what we're looking for. But particularly when you combine that in a uh, decision intelligence model where I'm really able to pick up on the nuances that that talent manager is conveying and say, you know, I'm not sure Jacob's right for that role. Here's why. Then you've got a virtuous cycle. So give it time. Yeah. And I'm also curious because in the AI model, it's one of those things where like if one if one data point is off, because it relies on people updating their LinkedIn profile, that all the data that the AI looking at being updated and accurate and knowing yeah. what, you know, courses you're taking, what books you're reading, how you're applying these things. So it's one of those things where if the if the AI is missing a portion of that, it's automatically going to disqualify you when in reality, maybe you are qualified for that role. So I guess the challenge there, and maybe that's where this hybrid thing comes in, right? Not just relying purely on what the AI tells you, but for a leader to say, hey, you know, maybe the AI is calling out that you're not ready for this role, but I actually think that you are ready for this role because I've seen you take these responsibilities. I've seen you in these situations. And I think maybe that's part of the problem is relying too much on AI to make the decisions for us. Do you see that as being a big challenge for leaders going forward? Like, you, cause essentially you have to question sure, and challenge absolutely. what AI is telling you. Right. I, I, I do entirely. And, and we know certainly from our research here at Harvard Business School that you can give really smart people really good support in generative AI, and sometimes they make catastrophic errors. We also know, by the way, that smart people, not this is some research that's been reproduced pretty much universally, smart people tend to over-respect what technology gives them by way of data. They're much less suspicious. Oh, well, top minds decided we were going to buy this system. It must work. And therefore, I'm not obliged to think about what it's saying to me, mm-hmm. and, unless that is that that recommendation is so clearly bizarre that I can say, "Gee, it's telling me to light myself on fire." That doesn't sound right. Maybe I'd ask, you know, what's going on here. So, um, but a couple of observations. One is, sure, but the more data you're both gathering and developing, the less and less drift there's going to be in the recommendations. The The second thing is, and I, I regularly talk to people who want to know, well, isn't the AI biased? Well, compared to what? Yeah. I, get I mean, the, the, the typical, we, we, you know, you know, lots of hiring managers have all sorts of biases, you know, and they're not, I'm not, I don't talk about people who are, you know, vicious, racist or homophobes or something, but, but rather people who are, you know, gee, uh, I went to the same school as this applicant or, yeah. um, you know, they really have a great handshake or uh, I, I used to work for the same company they're currently working for, whatever it is. So, so what this, we have to remember that AI doesn't make decisions it emulates yeah yeah and the more data you give it and the better decision rules you get it the more it's gonna get more and more precise better 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 fit with what you're actually looking for i actually did a poll on linkedin fairly recently it's only been up uh, for one day but it has around 400 votes on there and i said would you rather trust ai or leaders to evaluate the skills of their employees and now in all fairness i only gave people a binary choice ai or leaders and so far, 80% say leaders, humans, and 20% for AI. So it'll be interesting. And, you know, people leave comments and they're like, hybrid approach, hybrid approach, which uh, to your point, I think will be very interesting to see how that plays out uh, going forward. So the, the skill-based hiring, it seems like you're very optimistic about it. Um, do you have a sense of, like, timeline before we're going to be good at this? Because there are some tools and platforms out there right now. Um what are you thinking in terms of when we'll get to a point where this is mainstream, companies are using it, and it's doing a fairly accurate job? Yeah. I, I, just to be clear, I, I'm optimistic that thinking at a skills level will help companies make better decisions over time. Some of the other associated agendas like 
uh, some nonlinear improvement in diversity hiring. I, I'm not as optimistic, but um, in terms of, uh, I, th I think the path is going to be uneven by industry and by company. I think you'll get more progressive companies that are that are using technology in HR more effectively, that are integrating operational considerations and HR decisions much more tightly than they are in a lot of companies, where what causes someone to be productive, what are the attributes of workers, for example, who are hired, have been promoted at a high rate, have been more productive, how do I start isolating those variables to inform my recruiters as opposed to just have that be a very steep uh, internal silo. Um, that certain sectors that are really scrambling to fill skills requirements uh, or find uh, that the, the very distressing low workforce participation rate is impeding their capacity to fill jobs will get more innovative using skills-based hiring to circumvent, mm -hmm. uh, to replace really these proxy variables like degrees. The, the rate of uptake is going to be uneven, but I think for uh, it, for uh, thoughtful companies that are already pioneers in the space that you're going to see material impacts certainly within three years and even sooner. Okay. Um, so before we jump into something else, anything else about skills-based hiring that you think we need to go over or review or that people listening and watching should be aware of when we think about skills-based hiring, whether it's pros and cons, AI, humans, anything else? Yep. Uh, well, one thing is that uh, recruiting, as we've been suggesting, is a multi-stage process, and you have to really rethink the entire process flow and make sure that there's a lot of consistency that, you know, we're describing jobs in a way we're happy with on a skills basis. We picked a basis for evaluating someone's skills. The hiring manager is informed about that. The, it's de-risk. So the supervisor of the hiring manager, who is a person who's going to be this, supervising this worker, uh, th that their supervisor understands we're going to shift to this basis. So if they by subordinate hire somebody without a college degree and they don't work out. I'm not saying, well, that was a foolish thing to do. And what the, why the heck didn't you hire someone with a college degree? So there are a lot of surrounding incentives and metrics and data that have to be aligned for this to work. Uh, a second thing I, I would say about it is that, that um, uh, skills-based hiring is helpful for weighing candidates, but it's also got to be, that information has got to be assimilated by skills providers, specifically educators, mm -hmm. that we already have a bad disconnect that educators don't understand what really constitutes a good background in, in a hard skill. Yep. But increasingly, particularly in the age of AI, those skills we're going to be looking for are social skills and skills that are much harder to define in terms of curriculum. And uh, AI will revolutionize higher ed eventually, but it's also got to revolutionize, be used to revolutionize skills providers' understanding of what they're trying to prepare people for in the future and how that's articulated in skills and that gets reified into curriculum, syllabus, what we're looking for in teachers, uh, defining new credentials or degrees. Yeah, a lot of different areas there. Um, you mentioned participation rates. So I thought it would be really interesting to get your take on kind of the economy, the business world now. So participation rate, uh, you know, what's going on in the business world, the world of jobs. Uh, I, I think it's very, very related to the world of skills, whether you look at unemployment, participation rate. Uh, we can talk about different generations, but maybe just high level. Are you seeing good things, bad things? What What is concerning you? Well, the biggest thing that concerns me is flagging participation rate for prime working age males that you know we have a very large number probably approaching 10 million 
prime working age males in the United States that are not in education, not in training, not in employment, not looking for work, not incarcerated. Wow. They're just out there. And they're relying on parents and SOs and spouses. And you have about a quarter of them report that they're on some kind of pain medication regularly. Wow. They report that they're involved in entertainment about seven hours a day. It's primarily Jeez. video games. Uh, Crazy. Teenagers spend... 50% more time male teenagers on video games than they do in interpersonal social interactions. So we've got an estrangement from work and a atrophying basis for developing the social skills that are critical to being employable. That's pretty discernible and pretty widespread. Yeah. And uh, Nick Eberstadt at American Enterprise Institute has done fabulous research on this. Um, the um, uh, and and uh, Richard Reeves at at Brookings. So I'm concerned about that. I'm somewhat encouraged by what's going on. You know, slight resurrection of female workforce participation in recent quarters, but there are caps to women's workforce participation that are usually surrounded. The, the biggest driver of it is caregiving obligations for kids and for seniors that are in their family groups. Um, and solving that problem more broadly and more equitably is going to become very important because higher value added work is going to be increasingly female. Hmm. And the reason for that is that it is going to require two things at once. A post-secondary degree and women's degree attainment is pulling away from men's. 58% of current college enrollees in the U.S. are women. Uh, and women invariably score higher on social skills uh, evaluations than men do. And if the future is higher ed plus social skills, you are looking disproportionately at women. But we have lots of societal and cultural and economic barriers to allowing women broader workforce participation and more ability to commit to their most desired professional out, working outside the home path than um, that is going to be required to fulfill the needs of the workforce of the future as I anticipate them. What if there was a resource out there that could make you a better leader? that could teach you how to create an organizational culture where your employees are engaged, where you could go to figure out how to create a future-ready organization. Well, good news for you. I put that together on my Substack, which you can find at greatleadership.substack.com. We have tens of thousands of members from around the world who every week are getting access to exclusive CEO interviews, leadership hacks and tips, in-depth guides and articles that I write where I share insights and strategies that I come up with and come across in my ongoing and regular work. So if you wanna step up your leadership game, if you wanna excel in your career, if you wanna create a company where employees are engaged at work, and if you are interested in building a future-ready organization, then head over to greatleadership.substack.com. Yeah, it's funny. I, there was a report uh, the Corn Ferry put out fairly recently, kind of going back to skills, and they said by 2030 they expect a talent deficit of uh, over 85 million workers across the different economies that they analyzed, greater than the population of Germany. So, uh, you know, we're, we're talking five years away here. It's <laughs> not that long. Um, yeah. So you mentioned this idea that a lot of people are not, uh, you know, whether you're playing video games or you're on medication, you're just not in the uh, in the workforce, you're lacking these social skills, you're not being developed in the right way. I don't know if you saw this study that came out recently. I think it was, yeah, it was 25% of Gen Z workers who apply for a job have a parent go with them to the job. When they're in person, that parent comes with them. If it's on a Zoom call, the parent is with them on the Zoom call. And sometimes these parents even jump in and ask questions. And there's been a lot of talk about this because 
what a lot of people are saying is that this is because Gen Z is lacking confidence. They're lacking social skills. They're lacking communication skills. They don't know what to do in a job interview. They don't know how to talk to people anymore. Um, and so why do you think a lot of this stuff is happening? Why is this such a, a, a concern? Because 10, 11 million people, that's a lot of people who are not in the workforce who are able to be. Any suggestions on how to turn these things around? Well, I'm still, Jacob, um, so stunned by that data and, and so uh, so disheartened by the n certainty that none of my children would have thought to invite me to anything involving their employment. <laughs> I must have been a pretty lousy parent. Um, well, I do think there there's some data. I mean, we, we all know that that the systems effect of the pandemic and the effect that had on people's both communication skills, self-confidence, social skills, we're just beginning to figure out and it's all worse than we feared. Uh, I do think also that we have a, you know, phenomena now where, um, uh, the, the long-term consequences of more intrusive so-called helicopter parenting, certainly for yes. people with higher educational attainment, if you start making every decision for your kid when they're seven years old, it's no big surprise when they're 23, they can't make their own decisions. Um, I think also that, that the, the, in, in some ways this reflects some decent instincts on the part of parents in part, because <clears throat> certainly my research indicates pretty strongly that for the vast majority of people entering the workforce, those early decisions are hugely important hmm. because they start giving you the resume, for lack of a better term, that is going to become the basis of evaluation of your candidacy for other jobs in the future. And if you take a couple of fairly low-skilled jobs that don't really give you experiences that articulate into better jobs and what people who are offering better jobs or looking for, what does the AI in an applicant tracking system do? It keeps shuttling you to more of the same. Yep. And the U.S. economy is plagued by a barbell distribution of jobs where there are lots of lower wage jobs that require less time to acquire the skills through training or through experience to fill those jobs growing gap in the middle in the private sector, not in the public sector, because the public sector has been insulated from global competition. And then a bubble at the higher end requiring good technical skills. I'm not talking about coding, but digital, digital skills, familiarity, ability to learn digital skills, and social skills. <clears throat> if you get stranded at the wrong end of that distribution, oh, yeah. yeah, there are Horatio Alger stories that you can hop down, but they're mostly fiction. Yeah, that's a painful place so to be. So having, exercising some, let me make sure I understand who these people are and what they're actually offering you. I'm not saying I would do it myself, but I, I would admit that that I can understand how, not not a worry wart parent, but parents would want to uh, maybe at least know more about what's available to their kid yeah. than than my parents would have. Yeah, and it's funny, I think a lot of this, and I think we talked about this previously, is making its way into companies where, uh, you know, kind of the coddling parent is now becoming the coddling organization. And that's also not a very healthy approach where we've sort of taken any accountability and responsibility away from employees. And we feel like companies have to do anything and everything for everyone. And that's also not, not a very, very good idea. Uh, but going back to skills, another thing that came to mind is how do you balance the idea of tangible versus intangible skills? Or maybe even before we get into that, how do you balance employees who say they accumulate skills with wanting a promotion? Because one of the challenges that I'm hearing from a lot of CHROs, you're probably hearing as well, is that employees get identified, hey, you know, if you want to get promoted, you need XYZ skills, here are some training programs you could take, et cetera. And employees are like, great. They take those training programs, they take those courses, maybe you can finish a lot of stuff in a week. And then you go to your manager and say, hey, you know, I was told that uh, these are the skills that I needed to get promoted. I know I've only been at the company for three months. I started off as a manager. I'm ready to be a director now. 
because I took these assessments and this is what I was told I needed. And, uh, you know, the leader at that point is going to look at you and say, are you, are you out of your mind? I've been at this company for six years and I just got to be a director. You've been here one month. How do we balance the, the expectations of employees with the accumulation of skills, with the, the application of those skills? Because that to me seems AI can't measure is the application of those skills. That's where the leader, I think, really comes into play. Well, we, we certainly there are a lot of industries, and particularly in kind of a post-industrial economy, where where there is a tremendous amount of refining of skills and sharpening of skills through repetition, almost in a apprenticeship or artisanal sort of way. Certainly in things like professional services, there's been a material and negative impact of the fact that the move away from face-to-face -face work, face-to-face -face encounters with customers and clients, that wasn't just the way the work was structured. That's how the the way the skills were built. That you had a maybe you went to the advanced course on interviewing, but there was still a pretty long, shallow learning curve to get really expert at it or at ideation or some other skill. An awful lot of learning took place in coffee shops in the back of some Ubers, yeah. uh, you know, in someone sitting in 23C across from someone in 23D talking across the aisle about what happened today or what we want to ha happen tomorrow. <clears throat> I think a company though, that's suffering from that type of problem is, is doing a very poor job communicating what the basis for advancement is and what the role of corporate learning is. Now, if you have a company... Uh, like an IBM or a company that has a service like Degreed providing recommendations to workers about what type of learning experience they could have that correlates with a skills profile that the company has confirmed is, in, is a prerequisite for advancing, then you've got more of an infrastructure and much more accurate signaling. The type of, mm. for instance, you gave me suggests that that, yes, that that manager may be unrealistic or maybe arrogant or maybe obtuse, but but um, that they seem to think that there was this. I check these boxes and then I'm automatically qualified, and that either suggests that orientation and onboarding really lack messaging. Or they made a hiring mistake because the person wasn't listening in orientation and onboarding. Yeah, it's, uh, I guess that's where the, the leadership piece comes into play as far as how you communicate this. Um, you know, because I, I talked to several CHROs that are doing it well, and they say that they communicate that learning these skills will help you get promoted, but there's no guarantee of promotion. These just help you get into a better position so that when a promotion yes. opens up and when you're ready, you know, you, you can potentially get into that role, but it's not, uh, you know, a given. So I, I like that way of phrasing it. Um, so one last thing I wanted to touch on uh, before we wrap up is a section of the podcast I call the Leader's Toolkit, where we talk about some, some practical things that people can do. And uh, I wanted to touch on some research in that area that you've been doing around employees and bosses on what makes a good job for the employee and for the boss. So maybe we could touch on what those criteria are, and then you could share some advice and guidance on how do you meet in the middle? Like how, how far off, first of all, are we on what employees care about and what they define as being a good job versus what bosses identify as being a good job? My conversation with Joe Fuller continues for premium subscribers of Great Leadership Plus only on Apple Podcasts. And in this bonus discussion, which is around 15 or so minutes, um, we're going to be talking about what employees care about versus what bosses care about. And Joe's going to share some um, exclusive research that isn't published yet around what different seniority levels care about, how do we meet somewhere in the middle. It's actually very, very interesting and relates to some of the stuff that I've been talking about uh, quite recently on LinkedIn. So if you follow me there, uh, you may have seen some of those posts. So that again is only for the premium subscribers on uh, of Great Leadership Plus. When you subscribe, you get one of these bonus episodes every week as well as ad-free listening. I hate ads, you probably hate ads. So if you want to remove all those ads from your listening experience, head over to Apple Podcasts and subscribe there. And of course, 
We have the leadership uh, newsletter, greatleadership.substack.com. You can subscribe over there as well. And if you want to get 20%, uh, a 20% discount off the premium newsletter, you can email me, jacob at thefutureorganization.com. And I'll go ahead and take care of you there too. So thanks for tuning in, for listening, for watching. And if you enjoyed this episode, please send it to somebody who you would like to see become a better leader. I'll see you soon.